Hi, this is Dr. Justin Estri, and this is week six of PolySci 506 Bayesian Computational and Nonparametric Statistics. And uh, this week we're going to talk about <clears throat> measuring latent characteristics uh, from observable behavior using item response theory in the Bayesian context. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, what the problem here that we're trying to tackle is. Uh, the problem we're trying to tackle is how to measure something that we know exists and that influences uh, a behavior that we can see, um, but that we cannot directly observe. Uh, there are lots of examples of this in a variety of fields, including in political science. Uh, so the, the archetypal um, uh, problem that, uh, that item response theory was originally designed to solve was uh, measuring um, learning or, or a learning ability or uh, some kind of uh, a learning skill. So uh, measuring a skill uh, such as a mathematics ability uh, or reading ability uh, using responses to a multiple choice test instrument. So um, the problem here is that we know, um, we can see whether, how many questions a student gets right on a test, uh, and we know that that has something to do with how good they are at the skill we're testing, like math or reading or, or what have you, um, but they're not directly uh, related necessarily to the number of questions you got right. Some questions are easier than others, for example, and so some are good, better at discriminating ability than others. Some are so hard that nobody gets them. Um, questions measure different sorts of skills. So, for example, uh, some questions are almost purely math skills. Some are combinations of math and reading ability, like word problems. There are other analytical type um, skills that may that may come in there. And so, we want to recover that skill data um, out of a out of a test instrument, a uh, set of responses to a test instrument. And this is actually the problem uh, that IRT, item response theory, was originally designed to solve. Uh, but since then, it's been applied to, uh, to many different problems, uh, among them um, how ideology informs uh, voting behavior uh, in legislatures. So, for example, we know that um, uh, the congressmen um, vote according to a whole bunch of different considerations. Probably one of them is, is what they uh, believe, uh, their ideological beliefs. Um, but we can't necessarily read their ideology straight off their our voting records for a variety of reasons. Um, and, but we might want to try to recover um, that, that ideology from their voting patterns in some way. And it's a problem analogous to the testing problem. And if it works for one case, it might work for another case. Uh, another um, related problem to which this uh, technique has been put in political science is uh, recovering Supreme Court justice ideology uh, from uh, case decisions. Uh, this um, highlights uh, a particular theory in, in the court's literature, attitudinalism, that says that Supreme Court justices and other judges, but particularly Supreme Court justices, make decisions according to their ideological beliefs and how cases will impact um, policy uh, in, in terms of how, how they will benefit or, or harm uh, their ideological interests. It's not the only game in town. That's not the only theory of how judges behave. But if that theory is true, then we should be able to look at their voting records and recover their ideology from their, their case decision voting records. The Supreme Court, as you know, has a certain number of justices on it, and they make decisions by majority rule. So if we look at their, their, their votes, um, if you can call them votes, in these cases, we might be able to recover their ideology information. And uh, a, 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 another, a, a number of studies have attempted to do that. Uh, the Supreme Court justice case um, highlights uh, the idea that all of these measurements are uh, theory bound, which is to say that the measurements are, rec are recovered um, by assuming that people are behaving according to a certain theory and then measuring the characteristics that are consistent with behavior inside of that theory. 
so these these measures that we're going to produce today, and we'll talk about this a bit later, are are you know they they involve theory. They're not theory free. Uh, no vision, no measurements are probably theory free, but these are particularly bound to theory, um, and that puts some limitations on uh, how they can be used. Um, you can't use uh, item response theory based measures to test uh, a theory of how people make decisions uh, that's sort of driven by the latent characteristics. So in other words, I can't measure something assuming a theory is true and then use the measurement to test the theory. Um, so th these are not, uh, th th these measures are not magical. You don't get something for nothing. And uh, at the end of, the, uh, of today's lecture, I'll talk a little bit about the, the limitations to which uh, that these measures face. But inside of those limitations, they can be uh, extremely, uh, extremely useful. Um, so like I said, we're going to look at a bunch of different um, uh, cases like votes cast, yes or no survey questions answered, Supreme Court uh, justice decisions. And um, uh, what we're going to do is basically, uh, well, I'll leave that, uh, um, leave that to the, the, the modeling section. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to uh, pick the latent characteristics of, of, of both the people and the decisions they're making that are most consistent uh, with the observed patterns we see in their decisions. So uh, what we're going to do is basically say, like I just said, assume a certain theory of decision making is true. Now pick the uh, characteristics of the people and, and choices, the vote choices or, or, or Supreme Court cases or whatever that we see that seems to be most consistent with the data we've observed. It's a quite, I mean, it, it sort of should evoke some memories of, of how one picks parameters in maximum likelihood type scenarios. In this case, we're going to use uh, Bayesian methods, although one can uh, use maximum likelihood methods on item response models. Uh, like I said, this is only, uh, the technique we're going to cover is only uh, one particular technique of latent class recovery or latent class measurement. Uh, there are many, many others, um, factor analysis, you know, k-means clustering, all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is just one particular uh, 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 take on, on measurement, but it's a take with some interesting applications and it's found widespread use in political science. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. All right, so the first uh, item response theory based model we're going to talk about is uh, the RASH model, also called the one parameter model. And uh, the RASH model uh, works according to a fairly simple uh, spatial logic uh, that, that actually can be linked and is linked in a, an article by Clinton, Jackman, and Rivers uh, to, uh, to spatial decision making uh, via utility theory. Um, the idea behind the RASH model is uh, that uh, there's a, a latent dimension. Uh, we can't see this dimension, but it exists, and uh, it influences behavior. And uh, for this particular example, I'm going to label this dimension ideology. Uh, and uh, we've got two uh, things that we are going to rank on this scale. Uh, one is decision maker. So we're going to say something like uh, a congressman. Each congressperson has an ideology. And we're going to denote those with X, like so. And obviously there's far more than three congressmen, but we're just going to stick with three for this example. And then they have uh, votes that they have to take on various issues. And uh, each one of these votes uh, is uh, corresponds to a cut point, delta. Um, and I'm just going to consider one, or actually I'll, I'll make two votes in this particular example. So there's two votes right there, delta one and delta two. Now, uh, the way the RASH model uh, says that decisions get made is that each uh, person, so like Congressman X1 here, uh, looks at uh, their, their own position and the position of the uh, vote that they're deciding on and says, well, um, should I do this or not? And uh, negative uh, dimensions, uh, negative distance between the uh, one own ideal point and um, the location of the vote cut point mean that you shouldn't do it. And positive distances, like the one between uh, delta 1 and x2 here, uh, mean you should do it. The greater that distance, uh, the, be the more you benefit from saying yes, and the uh, greater the negative distance, the more you benefit from saying no. So uh, the location of the vote forms a, a cut point um, where people on one side should say yes and people on the other side should say no. Uh, Behaviors, I should actually make a note of this is votes right here. This is like vote cut points here. So these are like decisions that have to be made, like decisions. Um, now, 
we could say that this is a, a, a true cut point decision making. Everyone on the left hand side, for example, says no. Everyone on the right hand side said yes. Says yes, but uh, probably decisions are, are are really probabilistic, not cut point. So maybe what we'll do is we'll say, all right, um, your probability of uh, making a decision. So, for example, the probability that you say yes to a particular vote, you vote yay on a on a vote. Uh, is given by some link function, and I'm using the, the normal here, the normal CDF, uh, the probit, in other words. Uh, and that's going to be um, a function of your distance to the vote cut point distance. That distance is positive, you have a greater chance of making uh, a yay decision. If the vote distance is negative, you have a lesser chance of making a yay decision. Uh, and with no uh, normalization, uh, you can see that... Um, uh, right at zero, so at the zero point here, you'd have a 50% chance. There's one. Let's get another color here. At uh, at zero, you'd have a 50% chance of uh, saying yes. As that uh, index declined, you'd have a lesser chance of saying yes. And as that index increased and became positive, you have a greater chance of saying yes. So what we have here is this is PR yes, and this is the x minus delta index. And that function right there is recognizable as the normal CDF. So that's the simple rash model. You map positions into decision probabilities. The positions are first of the decision makers and secondly of the indifference points of the of votes. Now I should say here uh, this is um, a little different than, um, or I should say that the, the location of the decisions is a little different than saying it's the location of the proposal in ideological space. Delta is not the position of the proposal, it's the position of the indifference point or the cut point between the proposal and the alternative. And usually the alternative in a voting situation is like the status quo. If a bill fails, then the status quo obtains. That cut point, um, it could be located um, between many different points in space. So for example, it could be the case that the bill is located here, that's the bill, and the status quo is located here, that's the status quo. And midway in between these two is the cut point between where I'm indifferent between the two. Uh, but that same cut point would exist if the bill were you know a little bit to the oops, a little bit to the uh, left, and if the status quo were a little bit to the right. In other words, we can have the same cut point for different pairs of bills and status quos. Uh, in terms of the decision model, all that matters is where the cut point is, where uh, people are going to be indifferent between saying yes and saying no to this binary decision. So, but just don't get, try not to get confused between thinking that delta is the location of the, of the vote in ideological space. It's actually not. It's the location of the uh, indifference point or the cut point in ideological space. So, that's really all there is to a, a one-parameter uh, rash model. Now, um, there are different ways of, of writing this model. Um, I've written this in such a way um, that uh, you've got x1 and delta1 as separate estimable parameters. Uh, occasionally, uh, you can uh, people write this uh, in a slightly different way. Uh, they write it as uh, the probability of a yes uh, is equal to um, the logit of uh, beta times the quantity x1 minus delta 1. Um, that's actually equivalent because um, we can show that uh, this uh, transformation is robust to expansions or contractions of the, um, of the, of the space of decisions um, within certain parameters. In other words, that the beta is, is uh, it is actually separately identified. Well, it's sort of separately identifiable. Um, but it's the the model is, is uh, sort of these two models are equivalent, and this leads naturally to um, questions of identification. So instead of talking around this issue, let's just jump right into talking about uh, identification constraints in the Rash model. Uh, well, so you've seen the Rash model, and uh, there's a problem with the Rash model, not an insurmountable problem, but something uh, nevertheless to be thought about. Uh, the Rash model is technically uh, unidentified. Uh, what do we mean? I don't like black. What do we mean by unidentified? Uh, what, I mean, uh, what I mean by unidentified is the statistical sense of identification, uh, wherein uh, each parameter has to have a unique 
um, solution. Uh, in maximum likelihood framework, it would be a unique maximum likelihood solution um, in any particular data set. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that you shouldn't be able to um, change two parameters at the same time and end up with the same uh, likelihood or, or probability um, for all observations in the data set. Uh, the radish model is unidentified because, uh, in a sense, the spatial model is, uh, has an identification issue. So let's just consider um, a case where we've got uh, a couple of different, um, here's two different people in the space and then one decision, uh, delta one here. Uh, and the relevant criteria for whether these people decide um, uh, to, to choose yay or nay for item uh, delta one, uh, there's going to be the distances between the ideal point and uh, the cut point, the, the, the um, indifference point for this vote, delta 1 here. Now imagine what would happen if everything in this scale was moved over by a constant amount. We'll call that amount, mm, let's call it alpha. So we're going to move everything over by alpha. So now everything is in a different location than it was before x1 prime, x2 prime, and then there's green here. It moves over by alpha. This becomes right there, delta 1 prime. All the distances are the same as they were before. The distance from x1 prime to delta 1 prime is still d1. The distance from delta 1 prime to x2 prime, yeah, <laughs> I'm a very bad artist, that should be d2. In other, in, in other words, the key arguments that enter into the probit function, uh, remember the probit that's going to be used to calculate the probabilities of voting yay or nay, are going to be functions of um, each person's um, ideal point and the uh, particular location of the cut point for this vote. That's a distance right there. That distance is going to be the same um, in either of these two locations, the original location or the prime locations, for all these items. Now, this causes a problem because um, when we run our Bayesian model, or, or if we're doing a maximum likelihood version of this model, we need um, there to be a unique solution to the problem. Otherwise, what will happen is the, the, the Markov chain or the maximum likelihood algorithm will not be able to discriminate or choose among all these different potential solutions, and so it'll get lost, and you'll get results that don't necessarily make sense. Uh, fortunately, in the, this is a this is the one parameter model, right? Remember, this is a one PL, one parameter latent variable model, or the Rash model. We can force identification of the parameters by simply um, specifying priors for, for example, the x um, individual locations. What that does is it anchors the position of um, the vote locations in space. So, for example, if we say, all right. Um, here's the here's a zero point, and um, all the x's are going to have priors. They're sort of located um, somewhere in this space around a, a normal with mean zero and standard deviation, whatever, standard variance one or something. Um, that's going to force all of the x parameters to stay in this neighborhood as you're sampling them um, with the Markov chain Monte Carlo process, and that's going to sort of cause them all to to fit in that space and not wander far off into outer reaches of the space. It's also going to tend to concentrate them around the prior. That will allow for identification at least in the one parameter uh, model or the rash model. Uh, another way of going about this, uh, which will also work and which we'll make greater use of in multiple parameter models, is you can uh, force certain uh, either votes, I should say votes or um, people, deciders, in space. You can set a few of them to be fixed values. So in the one parameter case, here's what that looks like. So here's the, uh, here's a, uh, uh, the latent variable, the latent class that we're trying to recover, so this could be like ideology. And we don't know where everyone goes in this space, but we're going to say, okay, I'm just going to fix, let's say I've got 20 people. So x, you know, oops, that's not good. Uh, each element of, you know, there's, there's a whole set of these, you know, x1, x2, blah, 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 up to x20. I'm just going to say x1 is located right here at, say, 0. And x2 is located right here at 1. I'm just going to fix those points in space. 
every other person is going to be defined relative to these two points. So for example, if x3 is somewhere in between x1 and x2, he's going to be positioned uh, according to his relative uh, location between x1 and x2. If x4 is more rightist than x2, then he'll go somewhere out here, and so on. Um, if you fix x1 and x2 in space, what that does is it allows relative location or relative... Uh, it, it solves the identification problem by identifying all the other people relative to x1 and x2 in the one-dimensional space. Now, the rule in this case is that you need to um, have a, at least uh, one... Uh, you need to be able to define... Um, you need to, in other words, have a technically a basis space in the in the ideology um, in the in the space you're trying to recover latent dimensions from. So in this case, we've got a one-dimensional ideology. So we need two points fixed in, fixed in space to create a line in that space, which then everything else will be defined around. Uh, you'll see that when we do a two-parameter model, we're actually going to need one additional person. We need three people to be defined um, because that sets up the that allows us to define everyone relative to those three people in a two-dimensional space. So um, the long and short of it is that the Rash model is technically unidentified, but you can identify it um, with a few simple assumptions, and if you do that, everything should work fine. Now what I want to do is show you how um, one might estimate a, a, a one-dimensional or a one-parameter, one-PL, or Rash IRT model uh, in R. There are a couple of different ways uh, we can think about doing this. Um, the first way I'm going to show you is by writing an IRT model in WinBugs or OpenBugs or JAGS and then estimating it uh, directly on some data. Uh, so what I've done here is I've, uh, I'm loading up uh, JAGS. I'm going to estimate this model in JAGS. And uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is create some fake um, vote decision data. And so I'm picking some 20 ideal points. I'm going to have 20 people uh, in this example and 100 votes and I'm picking the midpoint or indifference points for each vote. Uh, I'm going to store um, probabilities and votes uh, in matrices, because I'm going to compare these later to what I'm able to recover out of the vote data. I'm going to use the vote data to recover ideal points, and I'm going to see whether I can correctly predict voting probabilities by storing the true probabilities in this PR matrix. So what this code does is just generates the ideal points and vote midpoints and generates some data very quickly. And you can see if I uh, just do the head of this vote matrix, what I have is 100 different votes and, uh, and 20 different people. And uh, each person's yay or nay vote is recorded uh, in, in, in the matrix. And the, the probability of them saying yay or nay is proportional to the distance between their ideal point and the vote midpoint as given by the normal. And there's the normal right there. That's the p-norm, the cumulative normal density. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, try to estimate, I'm going to try to recover the ideal points that I generated in JAGS. And so here's a, a, a bug file that I'm going to uh, run in JAGS that implements a simple one parameter rash type IRT model. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, all I'm doing is just modeling each vote decision in the vote matrix, which I'm calling Y here, according to the Bernoulli density with probability given by IJ, where probability is the log of uh, the difference between theta and delta. Theta is a, is a personal or a, a parameter that adheres to the person, hence it gets assigned according to I. And delta it, uh, adheres to the vote decision. It's, the mid, it's a it's of the vote midpoint. So it adheres to J, which is the vote. We've got N equals 20 people and M equals 100 votes that we're going to cycle through in calculating this likelihood. Now I'm assigning priors to theta, just simple normal priors, uh, mean zero and, and standard deviation, or actually in this case precision, point one. Uh, they're fairly diffuse. So that's, a, that's a one over 10 precision, so a 10 standard, uh, 10 variance, sorry square root of 10, so 5 square root of 2 standard deviation. And uh, my priors on votes are going to be given by common hyper priors here, and I'm setting the common hyper priors um, to be uh, just fairly diffuse uh, mu and tau deltas. Um, that's going to cause the uh, deltas to come out of a common distribution with a uh, common mean and a common tau, but I'm, I'm, say, I'm not saying I don't know what they are. I don't know what the characteristics of that common distribution are. So I'm going to save that and then just uh, 
use my usual JAG techniques, which we've discussed in previous lectures, to um, generate some samples. And you'll see that um, in this case, the data set's not too huge. It doesn't take um, the JAGs too long to um, get a good number of samples um, out, of, out of my Markov chain. In this case, I'm uh, doing a really quick, um, basically a total of 3,000 runs, discarding 1,000 of them as burn in, and then keeping 2,000. All right, so now I've got my IRT samples. And what I'm gonna do is calculate the posterior means. Um, for all um, of the of the uh, param the theta parameters, this is the um, individual ideology parameters that I'm trying to recover. If you look at, uh, I think it's call names theta dot s. You'll uh, must be. Oh, I'm sorry. Call names rt samples list object number one. Ah, you'll see that it saves not only, uh, it has a chain for each one of the uh, 100 um, vote midpoint parameters, it's saving those. Uh, I'm only interested in the thetas for right now, so I'm just going to basically hive off those, those last um, 20 theta chains and then take the means of those to figure out what my um, estimated posterior mean ideal points are. And now I'm going to plot those estimated ideal points against the actual ideal points. And as you can see, I'm doing great. The correlation, I bet it's I bet it's pretty close to 0.95 actually. Theta dot s ideal dot points. Bam, 0.99, doing great. So my model is accurately recovering uh, the ideal points. You can see the scaling is different. I've actually got a different scale for my estimated thetas. But remember, the rash model is not identified. It only identifies um, uh, ideal points up to a scale. And I set priors in my bug file that identified um, the model, but it does, there's no guarantee that that'll produce theta ideal points on the same scale. But it doesn't matter because as long as I'm, my deltas are defined relative to these estimated thetas, all the probabilities will be the same, or at least close enough for government work. Um, so now what I'm going to do is recover those deltas and use this um, to, actually you can see that if I do a plot of the estimated deltas against the true deltas, I'm getting pretty close to the deltas as well. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm estimating them quite well. The correlation is pretty high. Uh, these are the uh, true midpoints. These are the estimated midpoints. Uh, now what I want to do is see whether I'm accurately recovering probabilities. So what I'm going to do is just run through that code I had before to generate the real probabilities, but instead I'm going to use my, my posterior mean estimates to generate posterior predictions of a very simple kind. Um, I'm not really in factoring in the uncertainty in my estimates of the ideal points that have delta into this. I'm just taking posterior means of the theta, posterior means of the delta, to get a real quick and dirty sense of whether my estimated probabilities are in any way um, good, at good guesses about my true probabilities. So what I'm doing is just uh, creating a matrix of estimated probabilities, making the relevant calculations here, and then plotting the true against the estimates. And here's the, this is the true value here on the x-axis. Here's the, I'm sorry, here's the true value on the y-axis, the estimated value on the x-axis. You can see that uh, we're doing uh, pretty well. Um, what we're, where we're falling down, in so much that we are falling down, is that uh, some of our estimates of zero actually correspond to higher probabilities um, than, than we've estimated. That's probably because um, there are uh, cases where we don't have enough information um, to, uh, in other words, we don't see enough of the data set to recognize that a probability of 0.1 is actually different than a probability of zero. Um, you have to, with the rarer that an event becomes, the more data you have to observe in order to distinguish the rare event from the non-existent event. So just eyeballing it, that seems to be what's happening here. But in general, you know, seems to be, seems to be doing, uh, seems to be doing okay. So I uh, wanted to show you a quick example of how you can um, fix uh, certain uh, voters in space and use that as an identifying assumption. Uh, what I've done here in uh, IRTA, which is this uh, variant of the file we just ran, is I've set uh, the first and last um, values of the of theta, uh, which is the individual um, specific parameter, to be equal to an initial value uh, that is going to be sent to um, the bug file. And that initial value, I'm going to actually send the true value of the ideal points as a parameter. So this is a case where I actually know the ideal points, so I can, I can set them to have exactly the same scales. I've also changed uh, the, um, the other parameters uh, to have a very flat distribution. So we're taking out any kind of identification that was provided um, by the prior uh, uh, in the past, at least for, for theta. Uh, if I run this model, 
uh, and then I look at um, the relationship between estimated um, and true thetas, as I did before, I should find uh, that they're very closely related. Uh, and once it gets done here, we should see that that's the case. Uh, sample. Bam. Okay. Ah, look. Very closely related. Now you can see the two of them, here's the two identifying points, and they're actually a perfect match. Um, the rest are, are mm, not exactly perfect matches. The perfect match would be right along, or it would be pretty close to this line, uh, but they're still uh, highly correlated. And all the identification, all the correlation is being provided uh, by, those ident by that identifying uh, assumption, uh, not, or by those uh, fixed points, not um, by, uh, by the priors as, as they were uh, before. So that's an example of how you can um, provide identification by uh, fixing certain uh, um, actors in space. And that's what's commonly done, for example, uh, in estimating legislative ideal points uh, where you fix Ted Kennedy on the extreme left and uh, Strom Thurmond on the extreme right in the Senate, and that enables you to identify the rest of the Senate relative to those uh, two actors. I should say also you don't have to pick the most extreme two actors. Um, you try to pick people that are far enough apart that you get a good amount of identification provided by those people, but you don't have to pick the most extreme uh, person, uh, people in the data set in order for it to work. So uh, one dimensional model is great, works fine, uh, but uh, for a lot of the things that we care about, um, the characteristics that we're after are multi-dimensional. So for example, ideology is a really good uh, example of this. Um, let me give you a, a for instance. So uh, in many of the uh, um, uh, latent variable uh, models of congressional roll call voting over the, over the years in the United States Congress, uh, it's been found that there are typically two dimensions uh, to voting, um, uh, two dimensions of ideology that are recovered via voting. And those, uh, those differ over the years as to what they uh, might mean in terms of their interpretation. Um, so far, we, we've sort of been able to, in a fairly simplistic way, say, oh, well, we recover this dimension in voting, it must be something like ideology. But when you recover two dimensions, then you have to start to think about what those dimensions are and how they partition out whatever is being used to make the decision. Uh, and so, for example, uh, one might be straight up um, left-right ideology in the, in the traditional American partisan sense. Uh, and uh, the, well, another dimension uh, that influences voting might be something like civil rights. Uh, this happens in the, uh, for example, in the 1960s, where there are blocks of voters who differ um, on on economic issues, but also different blocks of voters that differ on civil rights issues. Uh, in the modern context, uh, this is uh, typically not exactly what uh, what we're after. Most of the civil rights issues, at least in terms of the uh, racial civil rights issues, have, have already been decided. Uh, and remaining civil rights issues are, are polarizing, but probably collapsible into a larger realm of what we might consider um, social ideological issues. And uh, those are distinct from economic ideological issues. And we might see different blocks of voters in, in, different, um, in different votes taking different positions because of their positions in these two, in these two matrices. Uh, so um, what would a, a two-parameter model look like in this case? Well, uh, we'd have people, just like before, that are in this space, you know, x1, x2, and so on, x3, put a third person in this space, uh, and there are going to be um, zero points uh, for um, voting uh, bills. So like here's a bill whose zero point is at delta 1. Uh, but now, when somebody goes to make a decision, they're, they, they're still going to compare themselves to the, as they did before, uh, but they're going to, instead of comparing themselves just to delta 1, they're going to compare themselves to whether they're to the right or left of the indifference point. So uh, delta 1, uh, if, I'm, if I'm interpreting this correctly, will be the point at which um, both options give a utility in a sense of 0. Um, the the uh, cut point line, though, has many other indifference points and uh, that's because it's possible to be indifferent between uh, two policies, uh, both of which you lose, <laughs> or you, you, you're worse off, or you don't like them, but you like them, you dislike them both equally. Um, or you can even like both of them, but like them both equally. They can, they can sort of both be uh, good for you. 
Um, so the, the, the cutting line uh, gives all of the different um, positions, ideological positions, that will be indifferent to this particular vote, this binary vote choice. Um, they're indifferent to both options in the vote choice. And so what we need to do in the multidimensional case is um, locate delta 1, but also locate that, that cutting line uh, in, in space, and then finally locate all, all, all of the voters. So uh, what this all boils down to is uh, we're going to estimate a whole bunch of parameters, much more than we, m many more than we did in the previous case. Uh, first, let me write down the model and then sort of give you a sense of how this uh, equates visually. So uh, in this case, the probability uh, that any particular individual votes uh, yes or in favor, and we're just arbitrarily saying one side of the line is yes and one side of the line is no, um, is going to be, again, given by uh, some kind of link function. I'm using the probit in this case. Um, uh, but now, for every vote, um, we're going to have uh, uh, a, a slope parameter on each dimension um, and a location parameter for each dimension. Plus beta 2, or I'm sorry, beta 1 2 x 1 2 minus delta 1 2 okay these are not squared terms incidentally these are just superscripts indicating uh, 2 a dimension 2 so these are the characteristics on uh, dimension 1 and these are the characteristics on dimension 2 we'll call this dimension 1 and they'll call this dimension 2 x1 uh, superscript 1 is uh, just this person's location on the first scale, which in this case we've noted economic ideology. And the uh, second is their uh, location on the second scale, social ideology. And the same holds true for, for delta right here. And uh, as before, the distances in, in both directions, so in this case this distance and uh, this distance, determine uh, whether uh, a person is uh, uh, going to vote for or against um, a particular object or a particular uh, 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 vote choice. Um, but they may weight these things uh, differently. Uh, and in particular, um, every vote choice might have uh, different characteristics um, that make it more or less sensitive to these two ideological dimensions. So consider, for example, a one-line bill that just says all abortions will be banned. That kind of bill is likely to be mostly social in nature. It doesn't have a lot of economic implications. And so we would expect its cut line to be fairly low-sloped in the sense of it tends to discriminate strictly on the basis of social ideology. We can imagine tax bills might be more uh, vertically. So this we'll call this the abortion bill. And this is like a pure tax bill, something that really cuts on economic ideology but doesn't really have much of a, a people in different sociologies, doesn't really sort them very well. Uh, and then, of course, many other bills, like this prototypical green bill here, have dimensions, uh, have implications for both. Um, and we want to identify those characteristics um, for each bill. And so that's where the beta comes in. This beta coefficient is particular um, to each bill. Um, so that's why it has superscript 1. That superscript 1 is just like the delta superscript 1. It, it indexes the, the bill in this case, not the person. It's the bill number 1. And uh, the slope of this line will be equal to um, the relative ratio of uh, the two sub-betas here. So like beta 1, 2, beta 1, 1. Um, the bigger that uh, beta 2 is, the uh, more weight, um, the, the more um, you have to compensate on dimension 2 um, in exchange uh, for uh, movements in beta 1. So, for example, if, if beta 1, 1 is really, really, uh, um, is really, really small, okay, so that's a small number, that's going to make the denominator um, very small, and thus it's going to make uh, this slope really, really big. Uh, and so what that's going to do is it's going to mean that, oh, actually, I think I got this wrong. I need to reverse this. Yeah, let's write it this way. Beta 1, 1 over beta 1. 
2. There we go. So if beta 1 is really big, that means that the numerator is very big, which means that this slope is really big, which means that you need a lot of compensation. Um, it takes a ton of compensation in the social ideology dimension to make any difference um, for how someone's going to vote because this bill is primarily economic. If beta 1, 2 is really big, uh, that means that the uh, slope is really small, really flat like this, like the abortion bill. And that means you need a lot of compensation on the economic ideology dimension to make up for any changes in the social ideology dimension if you're going to vote for this bill because it doesn't have much of a social component to it. That's, or I'm sorry, it doesn't have much of an economic component to it. It's mostly a social bill. Um, so we're going to estimate um, the beta parameters, the delta parameters for each vote. So for each decision, in this case votes, we're going to estimate a beta parameter for each vote J and a delta parameter for each vote J. And we're going to estimate, you can think about this being uh, the number of dimensions. This is a vector of dimension D. So if D equals 2, we're actually estimating two of these for each dimension. Uh, and then uh, individuals, decision makers, so legislators, if you want to think about it that way, um, we're going to estimate an x, i, for each individual. And again, this is going to have dimension d. So um, this is a so-called two-parameter model because you'll notice down here we're estimating two sets of parameters for the decisions, for the votes. So hence this is a two, it's called a two-parameter model. So as it turns out, the two-parameter model is uh, also unidentified. Uh, for similar reasons uh, as the one parameter model is unidentified. Uh, but the problem is a bit more severe in the sense that uh, normalization or, or, or mere priors won't necessarily uh, identify this model. Uh, what you need to do instead is to uh, fix a certain number of people in the two dimensional space. So, for example, we could fix one person, oops, fix a person at uh, one, I'm sorry, zero, one, uh, fix a person at um, you know, negative one, zero, and fix a person at zero, one. Uh, this creates a, a triangle uh, of um, space inside of the dimensionality uh, that will allow us to identify all the other um, people in the space relative to these three particular people. And so what we're defining by setting up these three people in the space is, in essence, the scale that we're going to use to estimate uh, the IRT model. Um, as long as uh, the scale is correct and as long as all of the uh, vote midpoints and cutting lines are defined relative to this scale, we'll be able to uh, appropriately recover uh, the probabilities. Uh, now you can see I've got an example of this in my IRT uh, two-dimensional uh, case. Uh, what I've done here is I've taken that IRTA model and I've added a dimension. So I've got two dimensions now that I'm estimating uh, for my um, latent utility. Um, but I'm defining three um, of the theta uh, variables as initialized values. Uh, and so those are just going to be fed to the algorithm as inits. Um, and, then, and then you're going to be, a, and the, the algorithm will, will just fix those in space and not try to estimate them. Uh, everything else is pretty much uh, as it was before in the previous model, except that uh, I've got two dimensions now, so I've got twice as many uh, hyper-prior parameters as I did. I'm also estimating these betas, uh, which I didn't before. I've got, see, these beta coefficients on the thetas there. Uh, that, that gives the, um, the, the slope, in some sense, of, of, the, of the line. Uh, so I'm going to uh, estimate those things um, separately now. Um, I, I could actually multiply uh, the, the beta times the delta here as well. Um, I'm setting up this model to, to, to not do it that way. Um, ultimately, that's not going to matter because they're, they're sort of, if I were to multiply it by the uh, delta, the delta parameter would just adjust um, accordingly. It would just rescale itself down. Um, so now going to my uh, R file, uh, you can see I've got, um, let's see, where am I? Ah, right. Yeah, that's the one. Here we go. Here's a two-dimensional example. So I've got my beta coefficients that I'm, I'm setting up. I've got two midpoints and two-dimensional ideal points that I'm establishing. Uh, and then uh, my, uh, my model is constructed according to the IRT model. In other words, my, the data I'm generating, this is fake data that I'm generating, I'm generating that according to uh, the model that I established. So if I go ahead and 
run this, I should get a, an appropriate um, data set, vote data set. So if I check on head vote here, yeah, it looks like I've got a set of votes. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is just um, estimate my model using JAGS the same way I did before. Uh, and it only takes a, a little while to update, a little bit longer because it's a slightly more complicated model. You can see it's taking a little longer to initialize. Uh, and uh, I'll just pause the video here and then uh, pick it back up once the model is completed estimation. Okay, so that's finished estimating. Uh, so now what I want to do is uh, I'm going to look at um, the names of this sample object that I created. So if I do names IRT samples, you can... Uh, Oh, it should be call names. Yeah. So you can see I've recovered a bunch of delta parameters and a bunch of beta parameters and a bunch of theta parameters. Now I'm going to focus on these theta parameters. Uh, so I'm going to extract, whoops, extract just those theta uh, estimates. Again, I'm taking the posterior means of the chains for these theta, these estimated thetas. Uh, and then I'm going to plot uh, my theta estimates uh, for the second dimension against my theta estimates for the first dimension. So this is going to give me the two-dimensional estimated ideal points that I've recovered using this process. And now I'm going to plot the true ideal points over top of them using different symbols. Bam. Ah, doing pretty well. Now you can see I'm doing perfectly on three of them, like that one right there. I'm doing perfectly on that one. I'm doing perfectly on that one right there. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's actually because, um, it's not because I'm awesome, it's because uh, those are the ones that were fixed in initial values. You'll notice I had to fix three initial values. Um, the theta init's right here, I set them to be correct, to be true. So I'm nailing those exactly. All the rest of them um, are, are, are getting nailed to, uh, to, to, to greater or lesser degree of accuracy. And if I look at the correlation between the true values and the estimates, uh, I'm getting correlations upward of you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.95. These are pretty good correlations. So I am doing a pretty good job of recovering, uh, recovering these estimates. And if you want to see directly, I could do a plot of ideal uh, points, say, 2, which is the second dimension, uh, against my theta est mat 2. And uh, you can see I'm recovering those, those uh, pretty well, not exactly on the same scale, although pretty close. Um, and I'm, I'm doing a pretty good job of recovering those pretty accurately. So uh, my two-dimensional model works. That's, that's kind of nice. Uh, now, I promised you that there would be another uh, way of estimating these models, and there is. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, show you the PSCL package, uh, which was put together by Simon Jackman. Uh, the PSCL package uh, has um, a, a, a method uh, of uh, estimating IRT models in multiple dimensions um, and also has some interesting data that you can use to practice um, this particular uh, method on. Uh, and it can help you estimate these models without having to uh, go through the trouble of manually writing a bug file. Uh, so what I've got here um, is uh, the PSCL package. That's the, uh, that's the package that um, Jackman wrote. And there's some data in this, and the, and the first uh, bit of data I'm going to use is uh, S109. Uh, S109 is um, a, a data set that uh, Simon Jackman prepared um, of uh, votes, roll call votes in the 109th uh, Senate. Uh, his data, his particular algorithm uses a, um, a, a data format called a roll call. And if you look at, uh, I think it's roll call, that's a class that is just a particular um, object in which uh, yes, no voting data is stored. Now, if you wanted to create a roll call object, now S109 is, is sort of already a roll call object, so I just layered it in and it was already a roll call object. But if I wanted to create a roll call object, um, I could do so. So if I wanted to create a, a roll call object out of um, my vote, my previous vote object, I could just use the command roll call. And uh, you can see I've created a roll call object using vote.rc, uh, specifying the vote matrix, which you can see depicted up here, and saying that the yays are one and the nays are zeros. And so now I've got a vote.rc object that I could use um, to analyze the Jackman's package if I wanted to, if I hadn't already written my own package to do that, or my own, not package, but my own program to do that. Um, instead, I'm going to analyze this uh, S109 data that I've, I've got. 
Uh, and I'm going to use the uh, S109 Verbose True to give you a sense of, of what's in this data set. So you can see, and I'm scrolling up here, it's kind of a long thing. Uh, yeah, here we go. So here's a summary by vote. These are all the different votes that were held in the Senate. The yeas and nays for each vote, and then also missing codes, people not in the legislature, and so on. Uh, and uh, you can see a lot of the votes are sort of, here's a 98 to 0, 99 to 0. These are probably like, you know, do we love America kind of votes. Uh, and then there are a lot of other votes that are, are closer, um, 40 to 60, 41 to 59, and so on. Um, here are the votes by legislator. And for example, you can see here, uh, Jeff Sessions, the Republican senator from Alabama, cast uh, 34 yay uh, votes and 297 nay votes. Uh, Richard Shelby, the senator from Alabama, cast uh, 351 yays and 284 nays, and, and so on. Uh, I'm a, I actually don't know this, but I assume that Bush uh, is actually uh, tie-breaking votes that Cheney cast, although I'm, I'm not entirely sure who that is. I don't think uh, President Bush was, uh, was a senator in the 109th Senate, but... Whatever, what do I know? Anyway, so what uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to fix three senators in this space and then estimate ideal points in this space. So we're fixing Kennedy to have a negative one, zero ideal point, uh, Senator Enzi to have a one, zero, so that's an extreme right senator, and Lincoln Chafee, who's a moderate, we're going to put him as a zero, dead center in the left-right spectrum, and a negative point five. so we're sort of putting him on the second axis, whatever that may be. And this constrain.legis uh, function generates the appropriate starting values, priors, and, um, and fixed points that are necessary to identify this particular model. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is just uh, estimate uh, this model using the ideal function. And I'm going to call up ideal here so we can talk a little bit about it in the help file uh, while it's running. So let's just let that run. Um, Ideal uh, takes an object, which in this case is a, a, a roll call object like S109. Uh, you tell it D, the number of dimensions you wish to recover, um, latent dimensions you wish to extract um, from this data set. Uh, you feed it some priors. So in this case, I'm feeding it the constrained priors that I uh, fed it before. If you leave this as null, um, it will actually just... Uh, create its own very diffuse priors, but they may or may, the model may not be identified. In fact, in many cases, it will not be identified in a two-dimensional model. Uh, the start values are actually also the CL2 object. Um, that Those start values are, uh, the nice thing about that constrain.legis function is that um, it calculates priors and start values for you, so hopefully the chain gets off to a good start. Uh, Store.item, uh, true, just tells the model that you want to not only remember the estimated ideal points for the legislators, but also the uh, locations of the, of the cutting lines, the cutting planes, which we, we can plot if we, if we wish. Ah, it's done. Uh, max iter is, just tells it how many um, MCMC um, samples to take. Uh, Burn-in is a burn-in, just like any MCMC chain, and thinning is, is thinning, just like any MCMC chain. These are the, de I believe these are the defaults. I may have shortened the burn in a bit, lengthened the max iteration. I, I forget, I changed it a little bit, but these are pretty close to the defaults. So uh, if I do a plot on the uh, resulting object, which I've stored in ID2 constrained here, uh, what you'll get is a two-dimensional plot highlighted by party. So these are the Republicans and these are the Democrats in, in light blue. Republicans are red and one independent in green. That might be Lieberman, not sure. Um, and you can see that uh, there's clear separation of the parties on both dimensions. Um, however, uh, the dimensions are not the same, and there's probably, uh, yeah, well, anyway, so that, that's, that's what's happening here. Uh, if you want, you can also, there are just a ton of votes in this Congress, um, but if you want to overlay the cutting planes for all these votes, uh, you can specify overlay cutting planes as two, and then you'll get zillions of votes. This is a, perhaps a little more informative when there are fewer votes, uh, nevertheless. You can, you can plot those if you like. Um, so what's nice about this is that uh, it allows you to do IRT sampling pretty easily. It takes care of a lot of, um, of, the, of, the, of the dirty work for you. And I should say, even though that this data set is a legislative data set, and, and even though it's sort of this example is very legislative in nature, uh, it's not the case that you always have to um, uh, 
uh, uh, that you have to use legislative data to use the ideal um, estimation command. This will work for any um, ideal or any uh, IRT model. In other words, anything you can put in an IRT model um, where the uh, responses are one zero binary, yay or nay type responses, uh, you can estimate an IRT uh, latent dimensions out of that data using the ideal command. So all you need to do is just sort of get used to the legislative terminology and it can be a, a very, very useful uh, package to save yourself uh, some bug code time. All right, so I want to wrap up uh, this hayride with a brief discussion of um, the limitations of IRT measures. Uh, you may have been you know, really uh, excited about the possibility of recovering these uh, latent dimensions out of um, observational data, and it is a very exciting possibility. It allows us to measure many things that uh, we suspect exist and are important and, and, and you know, can't directly observe. Um, but they're not magic bullets. Uh, and in particular, uh, IRT models um, assume a lot, many things. They assume, in particular, the truth of a particular theory uh, of decision making in order to recover their estimates. You'll notice that the RASH model and the, and the two parameter model, they um, recover uh, betas, deltas, and, and x's. Uh, on the a theory that uh, these things are all related to one another in a very specific way that produces vote outcomes. That means uh, a bunch of things. Uh, firstly, it means that they can be sensitive to specification. And, and what I mean by that is uh, the estimates are only as good as the model is. The model is a good approximation to, um, to the underlying data generating process. The estimates will very likely be good. Uh, if the model is a poor approximation to the underlying DGP, Probably the estimates will be bad. Uh, consider, for example, the possibility of strategic voting. Um, all of the uh, RASH model, the one-parameter model, and the two-parameter model all assume that people are voting pretty much based on their location relative to the cut point line of the, of the particular bill or vote or decision, whatever. Um, if, however, uh, 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 legislators don't simply vote according to their own preferences, but they coalesce with their party or they, they strategically vote yes or no in order to influence later votes or if there's some kind of log rolling going on. None of that is going to be uh, captured in this model and in fact you could get misleading indicators of their ideology because the ideology estimates are recovered strictly based on the vote behavior. They're, that's all we see is, is vote patterns. So um, what I mean by sensitive specification is the theory needs to at least, uh, the theory behind IR, the IRT process that you're estimating needs to at least be a decent approximation to what you think is actually going on. And if, if it's not, then and you could have a problem. Uh, it's also important to remember that IRT measures uh, by their nature can't be used for everything. For example, we can't use IRT measures to test a spatial model of voting because they're constructed using a spatial model of voting. So uh, you can't predict Y with Y. <laughs> you also can't make, use Y to make X that then predicts Y. Um, so uh, you, you can't use a, 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 an estimate that's generated out of a theory of spatial voting to then test to see whether spatial voting is a good idea or is, is a correct uh, description of what's going on. Uh, along the same lines, uh, you can't, say, predict vote choices uh, using um, ideology estimates that are generated out of IRT models, uh, at least if those particular choices were used to create the ideology variable. Now, I may be able to use voting patterns from previous years to estimate future voting patterns. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But I can't, for example, use um, legislator ideology as recovered by um, a Bayesian IRT model and then use that as a predictor of congressional voting behavior. That's, in its essence, using vote behavior to predict vote behavior. Because remember, IRT estimates are in cap, they're crystal, they're, they are vote behavior crystallized through the lens of a particular theory. Um, so with those limitations in mind, IRT models can be very uh, useful at generating uh, estimates. For example, if we need uh, measures of government ideology or we want to test um, some kind of theory that doesn't directly um, and it, if, if we can assume that IRT measures are true as a part of the test, uh, then it's perfectly acceptable to test them. You just can't test things for which uh, the, the IRT measures are themselves open to question, whether they're part of the thing being tested, uh, they're, they're part of the thing at stake. All right, uh, that's enough for, uh, for one week. Um, thanks a lot, and I will uh, see you next time.